Stefan is a, is a physicist and uh, many physicists have um, entered the field of biology uh, over the decades and usually contributed substantially to our advances in understanding in biology because they suddenly realized that biology sometimes is even more interesting than physics maybe. <laughs> but of course you can use uh, your background knowledge, the mathematical and theoretical knowledge, uh, and, and bring it into uh, understanding biology on a on a new le new level. And this is also the intention of of Stefan. Stefan, and um, I just give the stage now to you to start your talk, Stefan. Yes. So thanks for the kind introduction and for the invitation. I'll just share my screen. So please shout if this is not working. Perfect. Perfect. Great. Yeah, so thanks for the, for the invitation. And uh, you're all aware of these uh, breakthroughs that we had in recent years in single cell genomics and epigenomics. We're now able to probe cell states and cell decisions with uh, unprecedented uh, molecular detail. Now, this is just an example here, for example, of a single cell LMT-SEC experiment from the lab of uh, our collaborators, uh, Wolf Reich in uh, Cambridge. Uh, where you, uh, and this, uh, just this one layer of this experiment can probe the methylation state of cytosines genome wide for a large number of cells, of, in this case, from mouse embryos. Now, this is the kind of detailed information that we can measure with these technologies. But as a physicist, I always ask myself, what can we then in the end learn from such new exciting uh, technologies. Now, if I give you all to do the same experiment on the car and give you all the small parts the car is made of, you would have a hard time understanding how an engine works. And the reason for this is that you need to know where these small parts are located with respect to each other in the car. And the other reason is that the sum is greater than the parts. So, so we know that interacting complex systems like an engine show completely different properties than the rules that govern what a screw does or what, of, uh, what, a, what a rubber ring does, for example. Yeah, and in biology, we have a very similar situation that we're now able to probe detailed molecular states of cells and multi-omics with different, different layers of regulation, but very often biolo biological function relies on how these processes are organized in space and how they give rise to emergent properties such as in phase separation phenomena, in uh, condensation phenomena, such as in super enhancers, for example. And uh, in my talk, I would, I would show you how we can uh, we, we can obtain these spatial-temporal processes from linear sequencing information. And in order to do this, we have to overcome two conceptual problems. In the first step, we have to map given sequencing profile to a principal infinite numbers of processes in space and time. And the second step is that we have to bridge spatial scales. That means we need to understand how thousands of these local processes that are happening on the DNA and chromatin work together in space. Now, computationally, this is extremely difficult, as you can imagine. But in statistical physics, we have, in the last uh, couple of decades, developed tools that rigorously allow us to connect these molecular small sequencing measurements to emergent phenomena in space and time. And uh, in my talk, I would like to show you how we can use these tools to understand how the embryonic methylome is established from linear sequencing measurements. So what is DNA methylation? Because probably most of you know that DNA methylation is one of the layers of epigenetic regulations. It affects cytosines in a CPG context. And de novo methylation, so the establishment of new methylation mark, happens via a class of DNMT3 enzymes. Now, during development, these methylation marks 
on cytosines, uh, cytosines next to guanines called CPGs, are first erased after first fertilization. And after this erasure between roughly embry embryonic day four and five, there's a wave of new wave of new methylation marks coming up in the genome. And at the end of this process, we have just roughly 80% of the CPGs methylated. Where these methylation marks are positions uh, is important for cell fate assignment in the early embryo. And as you probably also know, is that these locations of these methylation marks play an important role in processes like aging, regeneration, and cancer. Now, to understand how this embryonic methylone is established in the first place, we first started with an in vitro experiment conducted in uh, the lab of Wolf Reich in Cambridge, where we cultured cells long term in two eye conditions, where these methylation marks are erased and cells obtain a naive pluripotent state. And then we exchanged culture conditions to serum conditions where DNNK3 enzymes or genes are upregulated and cells gain de novo methylation. And after we released cells to serum conditions, we conducted a time course experiments over roughly 60 hours of whole genome bisulfide sequencing and single cell NMT sequencing. Whole genome bisulfide sequencing is a bulk experiment giving us high coverage information on the methylation state of cytosines and single cell NMT sequencing gives us lower coverage because of single cell information on methylation, DNA accessibility, and the transcriptome. Now, when we analyze these experiments, uh, first, uh, it's clear that DNA methylation is regulated by many different factors. Uh, different histone modifications, different functional orientations, and we can follow the average level in, of DNA methylation in these different functional annotations over time. And it's not surprising that DNA methylation is gained at different rates uh, during the time course uh, of the experiment in these genomic regions. Now, what we found is that we were able to rescale time in such a way that all of these curves collapsed onto a single curve. Yeah, and this is quite surprising because it means that there's just one way of how in this experiment and this phase in development, DNA methylation is established in the genome. And uh, this curve also follows a very simple law called a power law, so it goes with time to the power of five over two, which means in uh, physics that this is self-similar time, in time, and it also means that, uh, that, that it, so, so it also means by reference to, uh, to physical systems, these power laws usually turn up in self-organization processes or in collective processes. Yeah, so where does this come from? It tells us that these enzymes are somehow communicating with each other while they get the DNA methylated. And uh, to understand whether there's indeed a spatial component in how DNA methylation is established, we uh, computed so-called correlation functions or covariance functions, sorry, covariance functions. Uh, roughly, these, these uh, correlation functions give us the probability that if a given site is methylated, another site at a certain distance away has the same methylation state. And if we compare what we computed here with what we would expect by typical enzymatic processes, which are here uh, coded in the red line, we see that these methylation marks are very strongly correlated along the DNA sequence. Yeah, there are very strong correlations uh, along the DNA sequence, and that means that taken together, DNA de novo methylation is a collective process that relies on spatial coordination in the cell nucleus. Now, this shows that de novo methylation is an interesting system to come back to this 
original question that we that that, uh, that I asked: How can we get the space and time dimension from linear sequencing measurements? And I will now show you how we can do that. Uh, just giving you a summary first. So we start by taking uh, the linear sequencing information. And in the first step, infer the kinetics along the linear DNA sequence. Then in the second step, we transform this into kinetics in the three-dimensional space of the cell nucleus. And in the final step, we bridge the spatial, spatial scales and we infer how thousands of these loci, loci give, uh, work together and give rise to emergent phenomena. Now to get into a little bit more detail, uh, we started with making a general ansatz for the enzyme binding kinetics of DNMT3. Now, so DNMT3 are enzymes and they do what enzymes do. They bind to the DNA, they can unbind if they're bound, they can methylate the, the DNA. But the data that I just showed you also suggested that there are some forms of interactions between these binding events. These interactions we don't know, but we want to infer them from the data because they contain the interesting biology. Mathematically, so it's absolutely not important to understand anything in this equation. Mathematically, we describe the time evolution of the stochastic binding profile and methylation profile, and uh, which is described by equations like this in very general form. And uh, our, so to say, first achievement uh, in terms of theory was that we were able to solve these equations for general and unspecific interactions between enzymes. And when we can solve these equations for uh, general interactions, we can also answer then reversely the problem for a given sequencing profile, what are the corresponding interactions between the binding events of these enzymes? And that's what we did. Now it's uh, of course quite mathematical, but I'll just show you the results. We found that the probability of binding of such an enzyme to the DNA decreases with a distance to the nearest bound site with the power of minus one over three. This is just a mathematical statement that has no biological context, but this biological interpretation becomes clear if we just consider what is the total binding rate of new DNMT3 enzymes in the vicinity of a bound site. And this binding rate increases with this size of this region to the power of two over three. And this is just the surface to volume ratio of just any three dimensional object. Yeah? And uh, this means that when these enzymes bind at methylated DNA, that causes local compaction of the DNA such that only a fraction of binding sites in the vicinity are available for further binding. Now, this is the interpretation of this mathematical statement that we inferred from the sequencing data. Now, in the next step, uh, now that we have understood, so to say, the kinetics along the DNA sequence, in the next step, we ask how this manifests in the three-dimensional space of, of the nucleus. And to this end, we considered how small length elements, how small uh, space elements in sequence space co-evolve with small elements in the physical space of the nucleus. And by performing these calculations, we arrive at equations. Again, no need to understand that. That describe the concentration of, of methylated DNA as a function of space and time in the cell nucleus. Now, if you're a physicist, which I don't assume, then you will recognize these equations because these equations describe phase separation phenomena. The blue term is a term that uh, describes aggregation or compaction. And if the uh, local level of DNA methylation is sufficiently high, 
this blue term will kick in and lead to local compaction of the DNA. Now, how to be a little bit more intuitive, this is a computer simulation of the same, uh, uh, the same equation with stochastic noise. And uh, here we see in, in the color, the density of methylated sites on the X uh, axis is, is some sort of space. On the Y axis is time. And you can see how over time, uh, domains or regions of highly methylated DNA are formed, which are separated by domains of lowly methylated DNA. At the same time, I don't know if you can see this in, over Zoom, yeah, we follow in these white lines, fixed positions on the, DNA on the DNA sequence in space. And you can see how these lines become denser in the regions of highly methylated DNA. And so you see how this process of de novo methylation relies on an interplay between changes in the topology and the chemistry of the DNA. Now, this is what we inferred uh, from, the, from uh, the data using theory. And uh, we predict these structures that emerge to have a size of th uh, roughly 5,000 base pairs or roughly order of magnitude 40 nanometers. Now, the first step, we can go back to the data and see if we can make predictions uh, to challenge this model. Now, the first prediction we can make is, can we predict the spatial distribution of DNA methylation along the DNA sequence. If you remember, this is encoded in these so-called uh, so correlation functions. That's a statistical summary of how methylation marks are arranged along the DNA sequence. And you can see that we can make these predictions very well, yeah, with, uh, although we don't have any free parameters, but no free parameters, we can predict the spatial uh, sequence distribution of methylated sites uh, very well for a range of genomic annotations and also from left to right for a range of global DNA methylations in cells. In the second step, uh, we can also test and predict the spatial association between DNA methylation and DNA accessibility. And this is what you see in the bottom line. You can see here, with, and this is, uh, this is described by the so-called cross correlation function. And you can see that this cross correlation is negative, yeah, which means that if, you meth if you're methylated, then you're less likely to be accessible. But we can also on top of that quantitatively uh, predict uh, almost precisely the relation between local DNA accessibility and local DNA methylation levels. Finally, to obtain a more direct interpretation of uh, this, uh, the, uh, the prediction that we make in physical space, namely the emergence of uh, highly methylated uh, condensates uh, in the physical space of the nucleus, we uh, analyze so-called single nucleus, nucleus M3C sequencing data of uh, embryonic stem cells and serum conditions. And uh, these kinds of experiments give us uh, our combination, so to say, that give us uh, local DNA methylation information and at the same time, a high C kind of contact uh, probabilities. And what you see is that as local DNA methylation increase, uh, the colors here, you get a, a strong enrichment of uh, context up to a distance of roughly 5,000 base pairs which uh, precisely uh, uh, corresponds to the structures that we predict uh, using the theory of a similar size. I should also mention that uh, there are super resolution uh, experiments that also found structures uh, and chromatin structures of strikingly similar size using a super resolution uh, microscopy. So once we understand these biophysical processes that underlie genome-wide de novo DNA methylation, we can use them and look in the genome for deviations from these biophysical processes, because these deviations must be biologically 
important because they're because the, the cell overrides uh, these base processes, so to say. And this is what we did. We can very well predict uh, DNA methylation, the spatial arrangement of DNA methylation in early embryonic development. But we can also find regions in the genome that specifically deviate from these patterns. And without going into detail in this slide, what we found is that gene bodies associated with uh, pluripotency genes show differences in DNA methylation, the arrangement of methylation marks uh, before, uh, during priming for differentiation, roughly two days before we see any changes in the corresponding gene expression levels in the transcriptome. Now, to come to a conclusion, I showed you a method of how we can uh, connect detailed linear sequencing experiments with a description of the spatial temporal uh, processes in physical space uh, that are relevant for biological function at the end. And uh, I showed you that these processes that we describe, although they occur at the nanometer scale of 40 nanometers, they are relevant and even dominant for genome-wide DNA methylation levels. And this is evidence in these early plots that I showed, that showed these power laws that uh, I showed that, uh, that uh, the power law behavior of genome-wide DNA methylation in the bulk sequencing experiments. Maybe one a discussion point uh, at the last, is this a method? Yeah. So yes, it's a method. Yeah, you can generalize this. You can take the steps that we do and apply it in different epigenetic contexts. But uh, there's no R package you know, that you can download and just run without thinking about it. Yeah, you need to have the uh, you need to uh, have a mathematical understanding to use these uh, these methods here. Finally, yeah, I would like to thank uh, Wolf Reich at the Babram Institute in Cambridge and uh, Stephen Clark, who did a lot of these experiments so together with Tim Lohoff, and in my group Fabrizio Almeida in the back who uh, solved these very difficult uh, conceptual theoretical problems and uh, with problems which were actually uh, being thought to be unsolvable. So he started his PhD and then a super uh, famous theorist came into his office and said that your PhD is unsolvable, but he, uh, uh, he managed to, uh, to do the hard work and finally, uh, finally, and even to apply it then to a very important process in epigenome. Okay, so that's funded by an ERC starting grant and DFT, and uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan, for this very, very intriguing story and uh, showing us how powerful physical knowledge can be to uh, bring our biology in a, into a context of, uh, well, I, I would say more regularity and a, a better understanding how it's organized. Questions to, to the presentation by Stefan from Paul. Yeah, Maria, please. Hi, do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, thank you. Thank you for a, for a very nice talk, Stefan. Um, I wanted to ask you, maybe I just didn't, didn't fully understand it. Um, when you could predict the correlation of the methylation along space and you separated it per genomic annotation, you had exomes, you had other things. I don't remember uh, the annotations that you had. Yeah, yeah. How did you actually include that information in your model? I think it's uh, pretty easy that, uh, I think the statement is that once you take, so, so, so maybe, maybe, I, maybe I go back to this slide here. It depends on the question that you asked. The absolute level of DNA methylation is a completely identical, uh, very different between all of these annotations, as you can see in the left plot here. But if you ask not what is the absolute level of DNA methylation, but how is it gained over time, and how is it distributed in, uh, along the sequence, then the answer is it's completely identical for all of these regions. And so to say, uh, 
we didn't make specific prediction yet, so we don't have any free parameter that we can tune or so. Exactly. Uh, even if we wanted, uh, the theory would not allow us to make specific predictions for these regions. And uh, these plots are just to show that the processes that we here infer apply to a wide set of genomic annotations. And one thing I should show, uh, say, of course, that we're talking about early development here and early time release and, and so, so roughly like for, uh, I wouldn't expect the same to be true for adult cells, uh, for reprogramming, for aging and so on. Okay. Yeah? So this so, sorry, you clearly see in the embryonic data. So once you dif start differentiating yeah, in later development, you, you see these differences coming up, but here in early development, uh, there's a generic pattern that we can pre predict with this, with this model. Okay, so I guess what I had not seen is that actually the fit is exactly the same for all the annotations. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's not, it's not so to say, it's not different fits. Our claim is that we just by knowing the global average methylation level, we're able to predict already the spatial distribution in all of these regions. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. But, 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 but this, um, returning the argument around, this says that irrespective of which functional region you have in the genome, mm. you have the same kinetics of methylation going on, but um, of course at a different, how would I say, uh, at a different level. So you have a very low methylation level, you have yes. a medium methylation level, you have a high methylation level, but you follow the same kinetics to go to a, a final state. Yes. Uh, so, so one, one thing one thing is very important to know that these are genome-wide average averages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. if there's a small set or one enhancer <laughs> or one gene that does something different, that wouldn't turn up in these plots here. So we're concerned mm -hmm. with so say the biophysical genome-wide processes that govern the de novo methylation. Yeah, I know because fully aware that even in the lab of Wolf Reich, they can make statements of specific enhancers. There are specifically regulated. It's not. It's not a statement that these uh, are, so to say, this is not true. But uh, the statement is that the statistically dominant process is the one that I mentioned. And so for example, there's processivity of also processivity of vnmt 3 so I didn't mention this, and uh, which is so to say suggest, uh, suggested in the literature. Mm -hmm. um, we can also show that these processes, even if they happen, they don't change the, the actual uh, localization of the DNA methylation patterns during de novo methylation. Mm -hmm. But now, um, for me now, getting, getting the step to your aggregates. Mm -hmm. So um, you, you're talking about these aggregates that are formed and based on the aggregates, you were saying that there are sites, certain sites, that are more likely to become methylated, others not. Because in these aggregates, there is um, a repulsion. There is not always uh, the same uh, possibility to have um, a de novo methylation happening. Mm -hmm. So stochastically, it, it should be changed. Do you think that there is something like a, a hidden, um, how would I say, hidden DNA sequence agenda that is driving this uh, that we don't understand yet? <laughs> or is that, uh, or is that more dependent on other proteins that, uh, yeah, help to form these aggregates? I, th I think so. So I have to be very careful with with uh, what I what I state because um, you have, of course, sequence dependent heterogeneity, and it's well established that uh, DNMT three binding has a strong sequence dependence. Yeah. So this falls again into the category of what are the absolute values of methylation that you get in the end. Yeah, binding energies fall into this category, how much methylation do you get? Uh, what I was answering here is how does it work? Yeah, and try to get this, for example, sequence specifically and how we define quantities we took the sequence dependence out of the equation, so to say, because the sequence dependence of the novel methylation, for example, yeah, is a different story. Yeah, that is, uh, it, uh, yeah, so that's so. So I, I, I wouldn't want to speculate about this because it's also not the subject of uh, of what we were trying to achieve. 
Can sure. I just follow up? For example, did you try, you know, DNMT3 A and B, the few different targets? Could that be, you know, identified as having different dynamics, or you think that it's too few targets to identify anything? So what we did, I didn't show it, uh, is we considered uh, DNMT3 AB knockout cells, you know, as a perturbation experiment. And what you see in these DMT3 knockout cells is that you lose these strong correlations, you know, suggesting that DNMT3 is, uh, is important to get this spatial feedback via uh, chromatin compaction. Yeah, so that's, the, uh, that's what we did, we did. But probably you, you refer specifically to DNMT3 binding sites taken from uh, chipset experiments or something similar. Okay, thank you very much for uh, the, the, ah, there is, a, there is another question. There's a question from Tianxi Chen. Um, is TET dynamics involved uh, in this DNA methylation process? So in other words, do you see also TETs being partners um, of your de novo methylation process and in, for example, stochastic demethylation as well? Yes, so, so, so yes. I didn't get into this, uh, but um, um, TET is definitely expressed at least partially in this process. And we can have this in the model, but it didn't, doesn't change any of the predictions uh, because, yeah, because of say TET is a more linear process, so to say. Yeah, it's, so these this strong interactions by the chromatin yeah, that overshadow mathematically or statistically what the tests are doing. Yeah, you can have demethylation, you can add that to the model, but it doesn't change the prediction. Yeah, that's why it wasn't talking about this, but it's of course, yeah, it's expressed in uh, at least some of these cells. And uh, it has also been suggested to have uh, functional relevance for, uh, for DNA methylation, of course. Okay, thank you very much. There, I don't see any further question in the chat, so please think about it uh, all the participants uh, for your general questions that you would like to address later on 